Vim has a lot of really cool features, and one of those features are the special folders that exist within the Vim runtime to basically split up your various pieces of Vim script code into separate distinct groupings. And these are very important folders to understand the way that plugins worked in the past, and less so with modern plugins, but still, modern plugins do actually retain that existing framework. Now, I'm going to be doing everything in NeoVim, so all of my stuff will be located in the .config slash nvim directory, but if you're using regular Vim, you're going to be working from the .vim directory in your home directory. So, the first folder we have is the doc folder, and this is basically where all of your documentation will be stored. Now, as you can see, there's nothing actually in here, and this is probably going to be true for yours as well, because there also exists equivalents in another directory. So, if you're using regular Vim, that'll be in slash user slash share slash Vim slash whatever your Vim version is, so Vim 8.2 in my case. And then as we can see in here, let's go into the doc directory. This is where all of the default documentation exists, or if you're using NeoVim, basically that'll be in nvim slash runtime, I believe, and then slash doc. And as you can see, we have all of the same files in here. So as expected, the .config slash nvim directory or the .vim directory are where all your user configuration files will go. Now, all of these files in here are basically just regular text files. So instead of doing an ls, let's do a cat. I know that's not a sensible way to do it, but we're going to do a cat because that's just a easy way to do it. So if we just cat out this file right here, as you can see, there's nothing special about this file. It's just a regular plain text file. And that's all the documentation for Vim actually is. So if you want to add any new documentation, all you have to do is add it into this directory right here and then just run the help tags command because what help tags will do is actually generate those tags that you see when you try to run help in Vim. So if we say run help, all of these here are what are known as help tags and they basically let you jump to different points in the document. But if you want to know how to write Vim documentation, that's not going to be this video. And the next folder is the colors directory. So this is where any color schemes will be located. So let's say we want to set the color scheme to something like test. So obviously, as we can see, there isn't actually a color scheme with that name. But if we actually go into this folder and we make a file, we'll call it test.vim. And let's actually go and save that. So if we go and restart Vim now, and now we actually try to set the color scheme to test, it's not actually going to give us an error message because that color scheme actually exists. Now, it doesn't actually matter that there's nothing in that file. All we need is a file with the name test.vim in that directory, and then we can set the color scheme to test. Next up is FT detect, and this stands for file type detect. So this is where you actually go and fix up any file types or you add in any extra file types that you need to work with. So for example, I've noticed that sometimes anything that ends in .txt doesn't actually get set to a text file. So that means any plugins I have for working with LaTeX just don't seem to work that well. And also I've noticed that VimWiki likes to just completely take control of markdown files but I'd rather have that be set to markdown like it should be. Or with the example of Calcurse here, these files are just being read as regular plain text files, but I want them to be marked as markdown files. So if we wanted to say add a new file type, let's say we want the file type, uh, I don't know, type. And anything that ends in uh, TP, we want to be of that type. So if we go and quit out of this, and then we actually make a file called I don't know, test.tp. So if we want to go and actually check what the file type is, all we have to do is run the command set ft. So ft is for file type, question mark, and that will actually check what the file type is. And as you can see, that file type is now set to type. And working alongside that directory is the ft plugin directory. So this is basically any script that you want to run on a specific file type. So for example, if we want it to run only on markdown files, we would name the file in here markdown.vim. Or if we only want it to run on the type file type, we would name it type.vim. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that when you're putting files in this directory, it should only be setting local values because otherwise it's going to go and modify all of your open buffers. You could also put a folder in here that matches the file type name. So for example, we could have something like type and then everything in this folder will be run on the type file type. So if you need some grouping, then this option is available as well. Similar to the colors directory, we also have a syntax directory and this is for setting syntax rules based on the file type. So let's say we wanted to set some syntax rules for, 
I don't know, markdown. So we can go and make a file in here, we can call it markdown.vim, and then put our syntax rules in here, and then these will only be run on a markdown file. Now obviously you could put this file in the ft plugin directory, but splitting it up like this is sort of convention. And the same applies for the indent folder as well. So this is where you go and set file type specific indentation rules. And like with earlier, if you name the file markdown.vim, then it will only be run on markdown files. But using this folder is just convention. You don't have to use it. Now next up we have a compiler folder. Now most people probably won't ever touch this because even people who write code don't usually compile it directly in Vim, but the compiler folder is where you actually go and set compiler settings. So for example, if you want to set settings for something like, I don't know, GCC, you can call it gcc.vim, and then you can go and set the compiler settings in here. You can check out this stack overflow post right here that sort of explains how you go about doing that. And then once you actually have settings set in here, what you can do is go and run compiler, and then set your compiler to something like GCC, and then if you have a make file in here, you can then go and run the make command and it will try to build the code. But as you can see, we don't have anything here, so I can't tell you how well that actually works. And like with the colors, the name you pass into the compiler command also has to match the name over in this folder over here. Another really important directory is the plugin directory, which is basically like the FT plugin directory, but will run on every single file. And I think the best way to look at this is this folder is sort of just a catch-all for anything else that doesn't fit into other folders. So for example, you have things like your auto commands, various basic settings, some mappings, Basically anything that doesn't go into the previous folders will go into this folder. Now less so for stuff you're probably going to write yourself, but for plugins the auto load directory is incredibly important. Now the way this works is it sort of delays the loading of code until it's actually needed. Explaining how this works is sort of outside the scope of this video. I would recommend checking out Learn Vimstrip the hard way, and this has a really good post about how this actually works and how you can go about writing something that gets loaded as you actually need it yourself but I'm not going to explain that in this video, I might do it in a later video. The important thing to know for now though is that's where code you want to delay actually goes, and most people are probably only going to have their plugin manager in here. In my case that's Vimplug, but you might be using something like Pathogen instead. And the last directory we have is the Hackable Hacks, it is the after directory. So all of the existing directories we looked at can also exist inside the after directory, and basically the way it works is like this. So let's say we have a plugin directory in here. And the way that Vim handles this is first the original directory will be loaded. And then after all of that has loaded, then it will go and load the after versions. So if you need to override any default settings and you need to make sure that happens after everything else, then do it in the after directory. But most of the time you don't really need to do that. It's sort of just a hack when all else fails. At the start of the video, I said that these directories are important to the way that plugins are packaged. And what I mean by this, so let's say we look at something like Vim Surround. So we have a doc directory and we have a plugin directory. Or let's say we look at something like Vim Hexokina. Say we have an auto load directory, we have a doc directory, and we have a plugin directory. Now there are some extra directories as well, but we still have these main directories or for example, with VimWiki. So we have a syntax directory, we have a plugin directory, FT plugin, doc, and autoload. So even though modern plugins get loaded in in a different way, they still maintain their legacy runtime directory support. So if you wanted to install plugins in the past, you would actually have to manually go and move all of these files into whatever folder they need to be in. So for example, for VimWiki, you'd have to move everything in the autoload directory into the autoload directory, doc into doc, ft plugin into ft plugin, so on and so forth. But luckily nowadays we have processes to automate this. As of Vim 8, we have two more directories. We have start and opt, but I think I'll save those for their own dedicated video. So let me know, do you actually make use of any of these directories yourself, or do you just put everything into your VimRC? So, I think that's pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So, so a special thank you to Joachim Kolbinian, Andrew Craig, Nathan Montezar, Joseph, Peter D. Rode, Tony, Brennan, Donald, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nephite, Tease, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there'll be some links down below to my Patreon, subscribe star, and all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available on various platforms, and I've also got this channel available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute, if you don't want to watch it on YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.